I was raised with this culture of um, falling out with people, and, and I didn't, I didn't receive it myself. Um, but she, yeah, she was so difficult, and she fell out with me many times. Wow. She'd go down the road. Um, she, she, she would put a coat on and and pack a case and say, "I'm leaving." I'm going to put a head in a, in, in a gas oven and oh. all these things. Yeah. So I, you know, when I became a Christian, I had to deal with some of that stuff, you know, um, which was hard. Um, mm. So I'd say that's probably the biggest challenge I've faced, uh, uh, rejection from someone that loves you. Welcome to What's the Story? My name is Matt Edmondson and this is a podcast full of stories about faith and courage from everyday people. And today I am chatting with John Sloan about his Christian journey, challenges that he's faced in life and some of the lessons that he's learned along the way. But before we get into it, uh, John, one of the things I, I like to do is give a shout out to past episodes. Uh, and I thought two episodes pretty apt for today, given uh, the nature of what we're going to talk about. And episode number five of What's the Story? Uh, you should check that out, Trusting God Through the Seasons of Life. That's actually with James Sloan, who is John's son. So if you want the, the inside track on what it's like to have uh, John as a dad, check that episode out. And then episode number six, uh, Serving and Following God with Nick Harding, who, like John, was also uh, a doctor. So uh, their experiences as doctors are quite interesting. Uh, you can find these and our entire archive of episodes and live streams on our website for free at www.crowd.church. And whilst you're there, make sure to sign up to the newsletter. And each week we will email you all the links and notes from the conversations. They go direct to your inbox automatically, totally for free. So make sure you sign up for that. And this episode is brought to you by Crowd Online Church. John, you know as well as I do, right, that not everybody wants to go to church and not everybody can get into a church building. And this is where online church works really, really well. It is a safe space to explore the Christian faith. And the thing that I love about Crowd uh, is that you get to join in and shape the conversation. They don't just talk at you. Uh, so if you've never been to church before, or if you're looking for a new church, check out Crowd Church. The website is www.crowd.church, uh, or you can email me directly at matt at crowd.church with any questions that you have. There you go. Yes. Now let's give a quick shout out to New Hope. Uh, the website is newhope.co.uk. This is the charity that John and Myra, his beautiful wife, started in 1999 uh, that functions in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda, running medical clinics and extending the gospel of Christ, where over 300,000 adults and children have been treated with medicines uh, and presented with the gospel. Over 50,000 responding and a number of new churches being planted, which is awesome. Yes, it is. Now, John was born and raised in Liverpool. He trained in surgery and emergency medicine, working for the amazing NHS for 38 years as an A&E consultant. And if you're outside of the uh, UK, A&E is basically the ER <laughs> to translate uh, for our American cousins. Uh, and John retired about five years ago. I know. He doesn't look uh, that old to retire, does he? No, he is married to Myra, who is also a doctor, keeping the doctors in the family. James has married a doctor. John, your daughter has married a doctor. You've got three grown-up children and nine grandchildren. And if that's not enough, you also sort of co-lead Frontline Wirral, which is a church plant uh, from Frontline Church uh, here in uh, Liverpool. Well, it's in the world, which is the other side of the water from Liverpool. So, John, it's great to have you here. I've been looking forward to this conversation, man. Thanks for joining me. No, it's great to be, be here. No, oh, it's awesome. It's awesome. So what is this crazy link your family seems to have with medicine? <laughs> OK, so my eldest son is a doctor. He's a microbiologist. Uh, Becky, our middle one, married a doctor. And then James married a doctor. So we've got all these doctors in the family. Um, that's just how it turned out. 
Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, how that um, how it has turned out. It's just, <laughs> and you're married to a doctor. You're a doctor yourself. Uh, so yeah, it's um, it's just funny how it's uh, how it's. So I didn't. I to be fair, John, it wasn't until I read the bio that I started to put all those pieces together. And I thought, hang on a minute, there's more to this story. So, um, so you were born in Liverpool. Let's go back. You were born and raised in Liverpool uh, before going to med school. What was that like? So I was born in Walton before Walton was posh, um, <laughs> and I lived. Was it you that made it posh? Uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I lived off the Reynolds Park, and we used to go sledging there. And it was a really nice place to grow up, actually. Yeah. Um, but when I was about ten, I suppose, I learned to smoke, and my mum always At had ten. Yeah, mum always had cigarettes in the house, so I used to go outside the wall uh, of our house and smoke. Uh, so that was one of my recollections of growing up in Liverpool. <laughs> wow. Wow. At 10 years old, smoking at 10 years. I remember when I was growing up, I grew up in the sort of 70s and 80s. And I remember quite a lot of kids would smoke then as well because it was like the cool thing to do. Um, and I, for, for some reason, I never, I never took to it. My mum smoked, but I never sort of really got behind that whole idea. Um, partly because I'd cough up whenever I'd get around it. So, what, why <laughs> was it just something you guys did when you were ten years old, or was it, was it more to I, it? I guess it was. I mean, I'm talking about the '60s, and I guess it was probably one of those things, you know, that mm. you did. Um, yeah, I loved it, and I smoked till I was till I was a Christian, actually. Yeah. Wow. So, so you, you're growing up smoking away, uh, James Dean style. I think that probably not helped everybody with that poster. Um, so you're, you sort of, you grow up in, in Liverpool, you, but you head off to, as we, we alluded to in the intro, you head off to medical school, right? Mm, um, mm. But are, are you a Christian at this point? Did you grow up in a Christian family or was there something no, no. that happened later on in life? No, my, my, my parents were nominal Catholics. Um, I remember one event really clearly. We, we had a had a debt, I think. Uh, I was about, yeah, I was about eight or nine. Um, and I said to my mum, you know, should we pray about this? Mm. And she said, no, 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 prayer doesn't work. And, and at that point, I realised their faith was just false. Yeah. Um, and that had a profoundly negative effect on, on me uh, for years to come. You know, I just thought faith is nonsense. Um, yeah. So That's really that, interesting. But your parents went to mass, right? So they, yes. and they, so they were quite religious. They were reli quite, re religious, yes, for sure. Yeah, very yeah. dedicated to that. But they just, their faith just wasn't there then? No. No, sure, sure. So religious without any real faith. Yeah, you're right. Wow, wow. So, I, but you remember this happening when you were seven that you suggested, well, let's pray about this debt and let's yeah. see what God does. Yeah, seven or eight. Can't remember when, but I, I remember the. I can re remember the day actually that it happened. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's funny how things like that sort of stick out in your mind, isn't it? Where you. Where you, you remember these these sort of these chance conversations as a kid. So the, did that have a big impact on you then? Because all oh, of a sudden totally, your parents' totally, faith wasn't yeah. authentic, right? I, I think for years after that, I just thought this was nonsense. This faith, um, that that event, turned me against God for many years. So what happened then? How did you? How did you? If that was for many years, then then what happened over those many years to sort of turn you back? Okay, so when I was um, probably 14, mm. I decided to test God, and missing Mass was a mortal sin, so I stayed in bed and pulled the covers up over my head, and I got to noon, um, and I was still alive. Yeah. And I thought, <laughs> it's nonsense, this is nonsense. Yeah. Um, but we, we went to university, and Ma and I went to the same university. Mm. Um, which is a miracle, actually, because there were 4,000 applications for Nottingham Medical School with only 48 places, and we both got oh, in. Wow. 
So did you know Myra before you went to university? Yes, yes. We'd, we'd known each other for a, probably a couple of years, actually. Okay. Um, but then we met these Christians and they were so troublesome. Um, they said, come and do this Bible study. Myra was going, why are you doing that, John? And I, I, I said, well, it's part of being, you know, in a university, you've got to be educated or what have you. Um, so we did this Bible study for three weeks. And at the end of the three weeks, we both were convinced this was right, you know, mm. that Jesus had lived for us, died for us. Um, Myra was committed. I was um, not quite as committed, really. Um, I wanted my lifestyle so, such as it was. Um, yeah. Uh, so for a year or so, I was totally unhappy because my life had been wrecked by this silly decision <laughs> to follow Jesus Christ. Wow. And Myra was quite committed. Um, yeah, so from 73, 74, uh, yeah, my, my life was awful. I almost left medical school, actually. I was so unha unhappy. Wow, that's really interesting. So you, you were... You, you'd you made a decision that this whole Jesus thing was real. Both you and Myra, yeah. what, made it at the same time? Yeah, same day. October the 23rd, 1973. That was the okay. day. Okay, yeah. October 23rd, 1973. Uh, <laughs> and so you, you make this decision, um, and then your life seems to get worse. Uh, yes. And you become unhappy following your decision. Uh, yeah, yeah. to follow Christ and have I understood that right that is that because of your desire to maintain a previous lifestyle were you trying to were you trying to say one thing and live another way what was causing that totally, that tension? totally. You, you've summarized it totally so I was smoking I didn't want to live a holy lifestyle um, I believe this stuff but I didn't want to live it mm. and it went on for oh into 1975, I think. And then David Watson was doing a, a mission in the university. Um, and I remember standing at the back, smoking a cigarette, and listening to him. I, I, I was right by the door at the very back. Mm. Uh, and suddenly I realized in, in an instant, this Jesus is amazing. Mm. And I, I, I stumble forward. And David Watson, I don't know if you know him or know of him. Mm. Um, he was a, a, an amazing Church of England vicar. who yeah. had been touched by John Wimber, I think, mm. uh, and the Holy Spirit. Um, but I stumbled forward and he prayed for me. Uh, and my life turned around at that moment. So I, I, I went back to, the, to my hall of residence and I prayed in tongues that night. Mm. I'd, I'd never done that. Nobody had ever told me what it was like. Um, but, yeah, my life so you, has changed. So you go to this meeting. and So what was it about this meeting then that caused caused your life to change in an instant? Because, I mean, if you're living for almost two years, this sort of, um, the, the life, uh, the, the thing, the analogy that springs to my mind, John, I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Karate Kid, where Mr. Yes, Miyagi yes. says, you know, if you walk left side, road safe, walk right side, the road safe, walk in the middle, squish, just like grape. I always remember this sort of scene in my head. And it sounds like you were trying to, you weren't living either fully for God or just not bothering at all. You were trying to walk in the middle of between these sort of two tensions and it was all going a bit wrong. So what happened then at that meeting? What was it that caused life to change in an instant? I don't know. Even to this day, I don't know. I mean, I was 21. I'm now 67. I have no idea. But something from the Holy Spirit touched my my heart. Um, and I, I would say my life mm. repeated on that moment, actually. Yeah. That's really interesting. So was Myra at this meeting? I can't remember, actually. She might mm. have been. can't remember. Okay, but for you, it was pretty radical. Um, and oh, so totally. What, yeah. I mean, you, you, you sense, obviously, God, you've had this encounter, 
uh, as we'd like to say in church, you had the encounter with a, you know, an encounter with the Holy Spirit. So you go back to your room, you start praying in tongues. For those that don't know what that means, um, or maybe have some misconception of what that means, just explain what happened there. Or speaking in tongues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I went back to my room, I think that night actually, and I knew there was something filling my heart. Um, so I closed my curtains and locked the door because I was so embarrassed, you know. Mm. I got my knees and I just started speaking this language that I'd never spoken before. Yeah. Um, it was weird. And every night I did the same. So I'd start off reading a psalm and then it's like an airplane taking off. I'd, st I'd read the psalm, then I'd take off and then I'd speak in tongues. Mm. And I'd pray for maybe half an hour like that. Mm. And no one had ever shown me or taught me. Mm. It was weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great though, isn't it? You sort of um you sort of had this dynamic encounter. So from that point on, uh from that point uh listening to David, you go back to your room, you have this encounter with the Holy Spirit. Did you the following day then had you made a decision, like Mr. Miyagi says, to walk the left side of the road or the right side of the yeah. road rather than try oh, to walk totally. in the middle? Totally. So my friend said to me, What's happened to you? You, you've stopped grumbling. You've stopped being a miserable so-and-so. <laughs> the people around me noticed big time. Mm. Um, yeah, my life was changed. Ah, and what about the smoking? Oh, I didn't smoke for five days and I didn't even notice. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. I noticed at five days and I thought, why don't I do that? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's funny. So um, it, it, it's great, isn't it, when you you sort of um, you hear stories like this. People they become a Christian. They have actually quite a, a, some people have quite a strong encounter with God. Some people, that, like I, it was just a decision. Do you know what I mean? And, and the encounters with right. God came much later down the line. Um, but for some people, they have these quite radical encounters at their at, the, at their sort of conversion, if you like, when they they become Christ followers. And people get instantly set free from things like uh, a good friend of mine. He used to be quite um, he was quite addicted to drugs and he, he, he's never had drugs since. Do you know what I mean? He, he sort of gets so free from it. And so it's funny how you, you, you sort of instantly stop smoking and then you don't even realise you've stopped smoking. Yeah, and yeah, some people sure. stop swearing, don't they? And they don't even realise they've done that. And it's, yeah, it's just really yeah, interesting yeah. listening to all those kind of stories. So how did Myra take the news? Well, she'd been quite committed, actually, over these, these months. Um, so she was delighted that uh, eventually this um this man that she loved was also going to be a lover of jesus mm. um, yeah so she, yeah she was delighted oh fantastic that's fantastic so when did you guys get married okay so that was 70 we went to university 73 i really could commit myself to christ in 75 and we got married in september 76 Okay, so it's quite quickly after that. Yeah, we were still medical students. We were third-year medical students. Yeah. Fantastic. So how many years have you been married now? I can't do the maths between now and seven. Well, that's almost 40 years, isn't it? You're coming up for... Yeah, so I'm 46, I think, to be 46. honest. 46. But... Oh, yeah, almost 50 years. <laughs> Well, yeah. mate, you've got something to do in 2026, haven't you? <laughs> got to arrange some kind of big uh, big deal for that. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Well, think about that. <laughs> <laughs> so what led you then to becoming an A&E consultant? How, what was that sort of uh, journey like? Yeah, so back back in the day, A&E was um, not what it is now. So I was a surgeon. I trained as a surgeon. I was... Uh, I did my surgical exam in, oh, I don't know, 1985. And for about two months, I was the youngest surgeon in the country. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Um, so I was a surgeon at 27, I think, which you, you just can't do it before that, you know, yeah. with all things you have to do. Um, and A&E was... Um, like the you know the cutting edge of surgery, you, you know, mm. people would come in and you'd you'd have to do chest surgery, brain surgery, you'd have to do everything. Um, 
by and by, it's turned into a service where you just admit people. Mm. So it's changed massively in the last 30, 40 years. But in those days, I just loved doing the stuff I was doing, mm. um, doing brain surgery. <laughs> wow. And I was a hand surgeon uh, yeah. full time, actually, for about three, four years. And I love that. Um, I sh probably should have gone into that full time, I think. Um, but uh, medicine's changed, and they, there you go. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. And who's, uh, just out of curiosity, who's playing the piano in the background? That is John Farrington. Ah, John Farrington, the infamous John Farrington. Yeah, yeah, we can. Uh, it's just interesting that you talk about becoming a Christian and he starts playing the piano, almost like you're on stage, you know, like the, <laughs> 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 like the minister's playing in the background. Um, but no, that's cool. So you, um, so you, you spent all these years working in hospital, but in the late nineties, nineteen ninety nine, you set up New Hope Charity. What was the catalyst yeah. on that? Well, you know, that's the story. We were, we were in France in 1995 mm. and a prophetess, we, we have some friends in France, in Nîmes, even now, we, we, mm. we on the phone two days ago to them. Um, so a prophetess um, said to us, um, Dieu, uh, God, he wants to give you a nouvelle espérance, a new hope. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, it, we were going through a difficult time. Um, but the nouvelle espérance, the new hope, we, we kept with us. Um, and then we were forming, yeah, a new fellowship. I can't remember exactly what it was, but mm. we had a dozen people. And we about two years later, mm. um, and we said, "What will we call our our new fellowship?" It turned into a church plant, actually. Um, and people said uh, we should call it New Hope. And we thought, "Wow, that's what mm. he said yeah, yeah. two, three years before Nouvelle yeah. Espérance." Um, so we called our charity New Hope, and it became a church plant. Um, and here we are, all these years later. Um, it's our charity that we've run since that time. Mm. So, how did you? How did it go from being a church plant to being a medical centre in the DRC? Because that's not a usual. No, no. A usual no. progression, is it really? Okay, so so nineteen ninety one. Go back a long way. I was in the town hall in Leeds, and um, God said to me. I feel really, it's one of those things where you really feel sure that God's speaking to you. And yeah. God said to me, um, you're going to work in French speaking Africa. So, I mean, we've always loved French, you know, the language, we've always loved France, the country. Mm. Um, but we couldn't do anything about it because, you know, I was working full time, we had small children. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, 1997, before New Hope, we began to work in Guyana in um, South America, um, next door to Venezuela. Mm -hmm. um, and we were just like uh, novices doing, doing medical stuff. Mm. Um, we went there probably seven or eight times, to be honest. And then we started working in the Philippines in 2001 after 9-11 um, and we really cut our teeth there and we realized that in Guyana we hadn't left any heritage mm. but in the Philippines we wanted to raise up workers which we did. Um, the Philippines now is independent all those yeah. years later, 20 years later and they run their own clinics. Then we started working in Uganda mm. in 2000 and three, I think, um, and we trained up a surgeon who used his private practice money to run the ministry, uh, and that's still going now. Wow. Uh, and then God led us into Congo. And all those years later, 
French Big Africa came into place. So the only place we work now is Congo. Um, so um, yeah, that's it's, it's been a long, long journey, long story, but yeah. That's fantastic. So you've got these. So here you're. It's interesting, isn't it? That you're you you trained as both you and Myra trained trained as doctors, medical uh, medical school, and throughout your journey, what I find fascinating is that training which you had then was not made redundant. You did the church plant, the church fellowship, but you're also doing all the medical stuff around the world and sort of using the medicine as you like, as a, as a sort of a way into different nations and to reach different people. Was that always the intention or was that something that sort of came, I don't know, a bit later down the line when you thought it through a bit more? Hard to say really, Matt, I don't know. Um, it just seemed to be a natural progression for us. Mm. You know, these things, um, these things just happened. Um, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I can't say really. That's interesting, isn't it? And one of the things that, um, you know, we, you see it a lot in church, don't you? You, you are people that are, are given gifts. They've got talents that um, they have that they use nine to five Monday through Friday. And it's almost like they, they can't take that into church and use that to help church and the kingdom of God. Whereas um, what you did was you took those gifts and you use those to build church in the kingdom of God. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, I did. I, well, th that's how it felt. Totally, mm. it felt we were we were who we were, um, and it was a holistic thing, and it was just natural for us to do what we were, you know, yeah. given the, the the opportunity to do. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Use use the talents and the gifts you have to build the kingdom of God. Uh, yeah. Step number one, right? Yeah. It's uh, totally. it's, a, totally. it's a beautiful thing. So, in, I mean, that's that's a heck of a journey, right? And I'm sure there's lots of stories and miracles along the way, because you know, knowing you, John, there's got to be. Um, so, what are some of the key challenges that you guys have faced on that journey? Is maybe a good question to ask. Yeah. So, I think um, I, I, I guess the smaller challenge was. Um, some Christians mm. that were <laughs> that were difficult along the way. <laughs> just no, I don't day. believe it's true. <laughs> difficult Christians, where where are they? I don't believe yeah. it. So, uh, but that was a minor thing, I think. Mm. I, th I think the biggest challenge in my life has been, I hate to say it, but my mum. My mum mm. was, was uh, she's now passed on. Um, she would be probably 100 if she was alive now but um she was a very difficult lady and she fell out with everybody that she met our neighbors um everybody everybody mm. the family she fell out with um so i was i was raised with this culture of um falling out with people and, and i didn't i didn't receive it myself um but she yeah, she was so difficult, and she fell out with me many times. Wow. She'd go down the road. Um, she 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 would put a coat on and and pack a case and say, "I'm leaving. I'm going to put a head in a in, in a gas oven and oh. all these things." Uh, she was told you that, right? Yeah, she said that to me when you were um, a kid. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, when I became a Christian, I had to deal with some of that stuff you know um which was hard um mm. so i'd say that's probably the biggest challenge i've faced uh, uh, rejection from someone that loves you mm. um, i think i'm fine now <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's Myra. <laughs> but um yeah that that's been my biggest challenge in life i would think so what was that like i mean it was your mum serious about this or was it a form of coercion and control? What was the, uh, the latter for sure? Right. I mean, look at the time I felt she was serious about it, but mm. it, in retrospect, she was just manipulating me, mm. my dad, my sister. Um, yeah. So quite, quite a bad person in many ways. And I don't, you know, I don't say that lightly against somebody mm. who's, but, uh, she did harm me a lot, I think, to be honest. 
That's yeah. that's incredible, isn't it? And so you you have these guys. And to be honest with you, John, there aren't that many stories of people having scars from their mum. There's plenty of people having scars from their dad, yeah, um, but not yeah. so much their mum. So what was the relationship with your dad like? My relationship with my dad was amazing. He mm. was sweet. He was lovely. Uh, Mara only knew him for, he died when I was 21. So Mara wow. knew him for three years. Mm. And uh, he was just the sweetest man you could imagine. He was like James. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So a lot like James. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So. Thank you. So how did he cope with your mum? Or did you never really get to the bottom of it because he passed away when you were quite young? Yeah, I was probably too young to really know. I mm. think he he was very tolerant. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how he coped. And it might have been part of his early demise, to be honest. Mm. You know, because she was really quite vicious. Yeah. Wow. Well. So what sort of, you say, you know, that's been one of your biggest challenges is, is learning how to, to sort of be, be free from that, I suppose. So what have been some of your key learnings there? Yeah, I, th I think it took me probably quite a few decades to understand that that had hurt me deeply. Mm. Um, and some of my reactions to other people were due to that. Um so probably in my 40s, uh, I began to process it. Uh, I, never, I never went to any counsellor or anything like that. It mm. just, um, just had to deal with it before mm. the Holy Spirit, I think. But once I did, it was so cathartic and so helpful. And it helped me understand other people's problems with mm. relatives, friends, whatever, um, so I think I'm, I'm the better for it, mm. um, you know, having been through that experience. Yeah, no doubt. It's really interesting, isn't it? You, you sort of, you go through this. It's interesting you're talking about counselling. I was talking to my mum the other day uh, and um, a, a, a family member I recommended goes to a, see a counsellor. There's some issues going on. I'm like, I really think you should probably go see a counsellor. Like, it's no big deal now, right? Just go to betterhelp.com. And just look yeah. for a counsellor, right? And, and, and yeah, it, yeah. It's, it, 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 there's no there's no stigma attached with that, I don't think, these days. But my mum said, you know, when she was growing up um, and when she was, you know, in the 60s and 70s, no one told you to go to a counsellor. You just, no, you no. just you just dealt with it. And so yeah, no. um, it just, uh, in fact, she, the whole counselling thing seems a little bit alien to her. She wouldn't be able to sort of recommend it. No, so sure. when you were when you were dealing with this in your... 40s um and the holy spirit was highlighting some things what I, I guess if you're going to summarize it was it a case of the holy spirit highlighted different behaviors there was uh repentance and asking for forgiveness on your part help to change or or was there more to it than that no there wasn't more to it no i think the holy spirit helped me to see that um i needed to just be neutral in my heart and um, mm. just let this go. So, no, it wasn't that complex. Mm. At all. It okay. was a big thing in my life, for sure. Yeah. Because I did feel very, um, for, for a long time, I, I was wondering why I was so, um, oh, dear, what would you say? Um, I, for a long time, I wondered why I reacted to people the way I did. Mm. And then one day it dawned on me, this is because your mum went down the road with a suitcase, with a coat on, 10 times with me following her crying mm. um, when I was seven or eight. And I realised the insecurity was deeply, you know, in my mm. heart. Mm. Um, and it's been probably the biggest thing in my life, to be honest. But once I dealt, once I recognised it and mm. dealt with it, it was fine. So what would you say to someone uh, listening, John, to the podcast? Because, I, I mean, I, I'm listening to you. I have a, a great relationship with my mum. I think she's a wonderful lady. So I, I, I can't, I can empathise, but I, I can't, I can't, yeah. I can't go, that's my experience, because it just isn't, sure, right? Sure. Um, but there are people listening to 
the 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 show who will go yes actually i this is um this is true for me in this situation that's what what advice would you give to people listening who are maybe um maybe when they're listening to you just going oh ouch something's something's quite true there yeah yeah sure sure well i i can't give advice i don't think on this because i'm not talented enough to do that but all i can say is that um, I left it with God. Mm. I left it with him. And the, 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 the balloon of pain was punctured when I left mm. it with him. And I, 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 I think it was dealt with in, in weeks once I realized what had gone on. So, yeah, that's all I can say. It was dealt with in weeks. That's really The balloon of pain was punctured. Love that. Love that phrase. <laughs> Uh, love that phrase. So you've obviously you've had to overcome uh, stuff with your mum. What are the sort of challenges have you faced, or is or is that? I mean, I mean, you say that's the key one. Is there anything else that sort of springs to mind? Uh, I think uh, the only other one I've I've experienced has been um, hostility from people that you work with. Okay. Um, and, and and really being troubled by why people would be hostile to you. Um, I mean, to be fair, uh, I don't think I've experienced that to a great t- degree, but that's been the only other thing mm. I've felt, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I remember um, when I first, I was working for Frontline Church uh, yeah. as a volunteer when I left uni. And I had a part-time job at the same time just to sort of pay. I was lodging with Nick Harding at the time. So to pay my board and lodgings, um, I worked in a restaurant. And um, and the the people that ran the restaurant, some of, them, when I, some of them I just did not get on with at all. And here I am, a young guy in his 20s, not, you know, been a Christian a couple of years, but still, a, let's just say my ability to deal with people was not as refined as it is now, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit more um, uh, confrontational is probably a better way to put it. And um, I remember there was one lady in particular who we just didn't get on very well for whatever reason. And there was one time I I remember look, she'd, she'd actually hit me in the restaurant. And I remember looking at her thinking... I'm going to lose it right now. Do you know what I mean? I'm just, and you know when you can feel. And I was just like, I just remember praying, Holy Spirit, would you just come into this situation? Because I I, I, I knew I was about to lose it. And um, anyway, I I said to the, the lady, and just walked off, right? I just, I didn't react to this point in time. And at that point, as soon as I invited the Holy Spirit into it, things began to change. And she and I became reasonably good friends over the next sort of three or four months. It was quite fascinating. And she um, she actually had a shop near the church that I would go sit in when I was working at the church and just go meet. I, that's how I met everybody in the local community, was just sat in her shop, just chatting away to everybody all day. It was great. And so it was funny how that whole situation got turned around, you know, that whole animosity at, at work got turned around for something that actually God used for his good, you know. Yeah. It's great. It's great. <laughs> so uh, your balloon of pain has sort of gone down. I'm curious... Uh, John, that um, you know, you've you've done all of these things. You've you've planted church. You are planting church right now. Um, it's not the first church you've planted. Uh, you've done all these medical centres uh, all over the world. You've done some amazing stuff. You've got some great kids. You've got some grandparents, um, and you know, you've had to overcome some stuff. So, if you could go back in time and have a conversation with your smoking self uh as you're going to medical school what what would be the advice that you would give that that young lad (laughs) well that goes back a long way um i think i think my main message um is that well it's the title of of the only book we've written as as a as a couple which is um five loaves and two fishes um Mm. So, so I would say to myself, um, uh, uh, just use whatever you have. There are only five loaves and two fishes, 
but use it for the kingdom because mm. we've found uh, that has been incredible for us. We, you know, we've we've had hardly any resource, any you know, hardly any training. Uh, I mean, yeah, we, we're doctors. I'm a surgeon, but in mm. the whole whole gambit, you know, it's not a lot. Um, and we've just given it to God, and He's He's used us um, in a way I could never have imagined. Mm. So yeah, that's that's my that's my life message, really. I think. So five loaves, two fishes. Take whatever you've got and give it to God. Yeah, right. totally. So that that boy that gave his lunch, he's in every gospel. He's been preached around the world. Um, all he did was give his lunch. And I think that's that's a good message. Give mm. your lunch. <laughs> give your lunch. Give your well. Give your lunch to God is probably it. Yeah. <laughs> this is a good clarifier. So, do you feel like that's what you've done with, say, your your training, your medical degrees, your marriage, your family? Is that what you feel like you've done before God? Yeah, that sounds a bit pretentious if I say yes, but. Um, uh, I've I failed so many times, to be honest. Mm. But yeah, that's been my spirit, for sure. That's been the driving force, maybe, is yeah. the uh, yeah. the desire, the heart's desire is to, is to yeah. sort of, yeah. is to do that. Where do you think that desire, um, I, I don't want to use the word came from, because obviously it came from God, right? I, I, and that's the obvious thing. But was there something that kick-started that or triggered that within you in terms of the five loaves and the two fishes because it's interesting when you ask this question on the what's the story podcast you know like what's your one message what's a piece of advice you'd give yourself and everybody's answer is different right yeah and yeah. that's the beautiful thing about the the you know the the kingdom of god isn't it we're all unique and god makes us that way and it's great um and sure there are some similarities sure there are some overlaps um, but this is the thing that is important to you because this has been your life experience. But I'm, I'm curious to know, and there might not be anything, John, but I'm curious to know, was there something that kick-started you down that particular route? I think when I started, you know, when I was a young surgeon, the youngest surgeon in the country for three months, I think, um, I, I, I probably thought that I had it all to give. Mm. That as the years went by, I think I realised I didn't have it all to give, and um, and and God would do stuff. I, I think I think it was through a, a series of experiences where I felt God um, say things to me. Um, I remember, yeah, that this this experience in Leeds Town Hall in nineteen ninety one when I was mm. I was on the carpet the way we were in those days and god said you know i'm gonna take you to french speaking africa and it's like mm, i i can't see how that's going to happen unless mm. you do it god and it was through experiences like that um that i realized that you know god's in control and i can trust him to do stuff uh, without me needing to make it happen yeah yeah that's really interesting so um John, I, I'm going to ask you the same question I ask everybody on this show, right? Uh, you're at the Oscars. You've won the award. Uh, you're, you know, your Lifetime Achievement Award, whatever award it is. You, you, you're up on the stage. You've taken a bow. Everyone's going, yeah, John, well done. It's awesome. Um, <clears throat> and you get like a few minutes to thank those that have had a big impact on your life, you know, like family, mentors, authors, speakers, preachers, whoever, right? Pastors. I'm curious to know who who is on your list of people to thank mm -hmm. Okay, so I would say two people, three people, three people. My dad was wonderful. He mm. was a wonderful guy. Mara's dad, wonderful. I loved mm. him too. Um, and then the, the A&E consultant I worked with when I first became a consultant, he was 53 when I was 31, so mm. a difference between us. But he was a godly man. He'd been a missionary in Nepal. Um, he taught me to preach. He taught me mm. many things in the Christian life. Um, he died about three, four years ago. Um, but he was probably the biggest influence on my life. Lovely man. 
Yeah. Wow. So that's so you you go to the hospital uh, as a young trainee surgeon. You're working with another surgeon. Um, yeah, and we prayed every morning together. Wow. Every morning in his office for the department for the for the staff. You know, what one guy had uh, HIV before we had a cure for HIV, mm. and we prayed for him, and we went to his house to pray for him, and we were just it was a you know, an amazing experience, to be honest. Wow. So that's life changing. And that's interesting, isn't it? So he was a missionary as well. He went around the world doing medical missions yeah. and so on and so yeah. forth. And probably that was the inspiration for me to do the same thing. Yeah, it's, that's what I'm thinking. Here. That's almost the catalyst, right? It's like yeah. in that, yeah. in, it's here in his stories, I would imagine, that sparked something inside yeah. you. Probably. Said, oh, probably. I, could, I, could, I could do this. Wow. So how long did you work for him for? Oh, we worked together for about seven or eight years. Mm. Um, we lived about a mile apart. The thing I most remember about Michael was that you could turn up to his house on a Sunday afternoon and just come in and chill out. You know, he 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 was just a just a dad to everybody, really. Um, so yeah, yeah, amazing experience. That's interesting. I look back and and think. Gosh, people don't get that experience very often. You know, I was very fortunate to meet him and work with him. Yeah, to to almost be apprenticed by him, right? Yeah, uh, discipled, Definitely. I suppose, is what the word we'd use in the church. Apprentice yeah. sounds a bit too Star Warsy. <laughs> My apprentice. No, I, I really was discipled. So I was thirty-one when I moved there, and I, I you know, I was a a dedicated believer and I was into the word but he took me to another level mm. he showed me things the Holy Spirit he taught me the gifts of the Spirit um, mm. yeah it was great mm. oh fantastic that's really fascinating isn't it and there's something quite magical I mean I don't know if you've noticed this but all three people you'd like to thank are all uh, sort of father figures really in, in a lot of ways yeah, yeah and there's sure. something quite lovely um about that and incumbent upon us i suppose as men in the church who maybe have got a few more gray hairs than we used to have uh to i admit uh, i certainly have Not <laughs> i get them around my chin now John. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um but it's it's uh, there's that sense of fathering in the church isn't there which i think is we had our marshal on the podcast recently who was talking about you know having a heart for men and the the, the need to sort of encourage men. And there's something about the older generation encouraging the gener the generation that's coming up, isn't there? And yeah. taking that responsibility oh, very sure. seriously. That's what happened in that hospital, you know, for you with yeah. with, uh, with Michael. How do you, how have you reciprocated that? I think is probably a great question to ask. Or have you reciprocated mm -hmm. that? I, I know you have reciprocated that, John. It's a leading question. Um, so what, what sort of things do you do deliberately that you've learned that, it, that sort of uh, facilitate that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so last weekend we were in Poland and we went to stay with our friends that used to live with us two years, uh, three, four years ago. Um, so uh, they stayed in our house um, with their little girl, and mm. now we they invited us to do, to do a, a a conference with um, Jack uh, Jack Mariner um, on missional communities. So um, that was a wonderful experience because um, I think we have that relationship with them. Mm. So they I, I call them the Wodgers because I can't pronounce their name. <laughs> The Wodgers are probably in their mid thirties, mm. um, but uh, I think I have that sort of relationship with him and mm. and wife, um, and which is a joy really because mm. uh, you know um, if you can't pass on something you've learned, then um, it's a sadness, isn't it? You know, you need to be, be able to pass on through your heart. Uh, things that matter to other people yeah yeah you do and it's interesting i mean you meant i mean we heard john farrington playing the piano in the background but you have the john and anna grace 
and yeah, we staying do. at your yeah. house with uh, with Eden as well. And that is another form of it, isn't it? It's actually let's do family together. And I know you guys yeah. are sort of working, uh, establishing Frontline World. And if you are in the world looking for a church, check out Frontline World. Um, and but it's that it's not an operating room, but it's your home, uh, yeah. and you're 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 sort of doing the same thing there, right? Yeah, yeah, totally, to- totally. So uh, we have a really good relationship with John and um, Anna Grace, AG, as she's known, uh, and Eden. Um, mm. Eden comes down the stairs every morning, gives me a cuddle. Um, they're like family with us. And mm. family family really matters, I think. Mm. Um, I think it's so powerful. Um, yeah, so the thing that we learned from Michael Flowers, we probably are duplicating in their life too and and the watchers yeah and the watchers. yeah it's really interesting isn't it and i think some of these things you do without realizing you're doing them it's only when you sort of piece it all together and go, oh yeah okay my fair play i see what you're doing there god see what you're doing there yeah. oh brilliant absolutely brilliant john listen uh thank you for joining us on uh what's the story it's been great having having this conversation i always i always love our chats um, if people want to reach out to you, if people want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? I think just email me, mm. Dr. John Sloan. You can see the uh, the spelling there, Dr. John Sloan at gmail.com. Dr. John Sloan. Me. No problem. Fantastic. So, yeah, if you've yeah. got any questions for John, uh, do email him and reach out to him. I'm sure he'd love to. Yeah. Uh, love to answer them. Uh, what we've not touched on yet, and maybe we'll talk to, to con, uh, <laughs> touch on this uh, in maybe one of the live streams, John, is, is that um, uh, John and Myra's top tips for parenting, uh, and also John and Myra's top tips for grandparenting, uh, which is uh, which is going to be really interesting. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining us, uh, mate. It's been an absolute blast, and I'm super grateful for you, man. And just love hearing the stories and all the work that you do and you can see the legacy that is passed into james at imagine if and all that sort of stuff so uh thank you so much for being with us man you're a legend bless you be nice to be with you see you bye-bye ah, that's been great so there you have it what a fantastic conversation with john thank you john again for joining me today remember to check out crowd online church at www.crowd.church even if you might not see the point of church uh, crowd is a digital church on a quest to discover how Jesus helps us live a more meaningful life. We are a community, a space to explore the Christian faith and a place where you can contribute and grow and you are welcome at Crowd Church. And it also goes to say, you are welcome at Frontline Wirral. Uh, Be sure to subscribe to What's the Story wherever you get your podcast from because we have some great stories lined up and we don't want you to miss any of them. And in case no one has told you yet today, you are awesome yes you are it's just a burden you have to bear john has to bear it i have to bear it we are fearfully and wonderfully made uh we are god's poetry it's just it's great we are his workmanship now what's the story is produced by crowd online church you can find our entire archive of episodes on your favorite podcast app the team that makes this show possible is set off bane on george mcquaig josh catchpole estelle robin and tim johnson our theme song was written by josh edmondson and if you would like to read the transcript or show notes head over to the website www.crowd.church where you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter and get all of this good stuff direct your inbox box totally for free that's it from me that's it from john thank you so much for joining us have a fantastic week i'll see you next time bye for now